Good morning, everyone. How are you doing this morning? Good. Welcome to the 8th Annual Academic Convocation. I'm Rick Muma, President here at Wichita State, and I'd like to extend a warm welcome to our students, faculty, staff, and all community members attending today's program. Academic Convocation is an event that is meant to bring our learning community together to celebrate a new academic year and tie into the ideas and themes from the WSU Common Read Program. This year's book, My Broken Language, a memoir by Kira Alegria Hudis, is being used in several classes this year and serves as the foundation for a collection of programs that will unfold over the coming months. And we are honored and excited to have Kira with us today. Before we get to our speakers uh, for today and our program today, I'd like to recognize some of our outstanding faculty, as we do each year, for standing, setting the standard for teaching research activities at Wichita State. On the screen, you will see the names of our faculty members who were honored with the 2023 Faculty Awards this past spring. If there are any faculty members present with us today, please stand as your name is read. The first one is Jay Han Boon, Excellence in Online Teaching, Nils Hackinson, Excellence in Research, Amy Drayson Ham, Leadership in the Advancement of Teaching, John Hammond, Academy for Effective Teaching, Hong Shi He, Young Faculty Risk Taker, David Long, Excellence in Teaching, Mathili Menon, Young Faculty Scholar, Aubrey Nyhaus, Young Faculty Risk Taker, Lisa Parcell, Excellence in Community Research, Perlikur Tam Tam Academy for Effective Teaching, and Byram Yildirim, Faculty Risk Taker. Thank you all for your work in helping strengthen our academic community. <laughs> this year, our student speaker will be Iris Okiri. Iris is a dedicated and accomplished student at Wichita State University, hailing from Dallas, Texas. She is majoring in marketing through the W. Frank Barton School of Business and minoring in Spanish. Her service as president of the WSU student body, vice president of the Epsilon Alpha chapter of Alpha Kappa Alpha Sorority Incorporated, and resident assistant for housing and resident life shows her dedication to her academic pursuits her leadership roles, and community building efforts. She's an inspiring role model for her peers and an asset to Wichita State University. Please welcome Iris to the podium. I am so honored to have had the opportunity to read my broken language. Throughout this memoir, Hudie shares personal anecdotes and challenges she faced in her life and career. Her journey highlights the importance of resilience, learning from setbacks, and finding one's voice. Hudie's reflects on her own cultural identity as a Latina and the role that language plays in shaping that identity. She explores the tensions between her Puerto Rican heritage and her American upbringing and how it has influenced her sense of self. As a child, my parents never allowed my sister nor I to say races. We went by ice cream flavors. For example, chocolate, vanilla, caramel, peanut butter, etc. We did this because my parents wanted us to love all people like we loved ice cream. My parents are from two totally different cultural backgrounds. My mother is Mexican and my father is Nigerian. I've had my societal struggles with my identity, my hair, my skin tone, but I've learned from all of them. They've shaped me into the Afro-Latina woman I am today. Hudis discusses the importance of family and heritage in shaping one's identity. She explores the stories and traditions passed down through generations and how they connect individuals with their roots. La familia lo es todo. In the Hispanic culture, I just feel like we are so family oriented. In the book, Hudis tells the story of the first time of her hanging out with the older cousins and becoming a woman all in one day. Personally, I could relate to having so many cousins, but being too young to hang out with the older ones and too old to be playing with the younger ones. The stories to tell. 
I remember the first time I was allowed to sit with the adults and hear what they were talking about. When I tell you it was Theas and Theos drinking beverages, just reminiscing on stories from their childhood. I'll never forget listening to Theo, Roy, and Ramon telling the story about Thea Betty wanting to go to a casino and having several Coca-Colas and barely making it to the restroom. These men were screaming, laughing, mimicking Thea Betty. But before they left, they had to make sure they said, make sure you give her a call so you don't give her ojo. The complexity of language is a huge theme throughout this story, as Hudes delves into the multifaceted nature of language, discussing how it can both unite us and divide us. She explores how language can be a powerful tool for communication and self-expression, but also can be a source of frustration and miscommunication. Nobody has the same walk of life from the next, and I think that it is important to celebrate differences with the intent to respect the differences. On behalf of the Student Government Association and the rest of the student body, welcome to Wichita State. You have made it far into the year as we celebrate the end of the first six weeks of the semester. You are achieving something that many people dream of the opportunity to go to college. Whether you're the first to go to college or the fifth, you should honor this time and celebrate your collective victories and accomplishment. Find your people. Speak up when things are hard. Reach out for help. I know it's easier said than done. Check in on your people. Don't ghost your family. Your mom just wants to know that you're eating and going to class. I am here for you. Welcome to Wichita State, and I hope you make the next four years truly something to remember. In the tapestry of life, we are all threads of unique experiences and stories. Just as Kiara Alegria Hudis learned from her broken language, remember that our imperfections are our strengths, and our stories are our bridges to understanding. Embrace your identity, share your narratives, and find unity and diversity. As I embrace my Latinidad, I invite you to embrace who you are and to live in this life authentically you. Thank you. This year, our guest speaker will be Dr. Sarah Mata. Dr. Mata is the Executive Director of Hispanic Serving Initiatives and Assistant Teaching Professor in Intervention Services and Leadership in Education at Wichita State University. Dr. Mata received a bachelor's degree in sociology with an emphasis in juvenile corrections and treatment, a master's in communi community counseling, a master's in sociology, and a doctorate in social foundations from Oklahoma State University. Throughout Dr. Mata's career in higher education, mentoring and advocating for students has been the core and primary purpose of the work. Her contribution to Wichita State University, the Hispanic Association of Colleges and Universities, court-appointed special advocates of Sedgwick County and the National Association of Student Personnel Administrators is second to none. Please welcome Dr. Sarah Mata to the stage. Thank you, Iris. Good morning. Yesterday, we received exciting news that Wichita State University hit the highest enrollment in its 128-year history. We are grateful to each and every one of you for choosing WSU as your home, pursuing a degree, and ultimately becoming alum, representing being a shocker all along the way. Through this excitement and celebration of all of you becoming a part of WSU, the work of being an executive director of Hispanic Serving Initiatives is important to making sure that we are doing all that we can to best serve students with intentionality and informed purpose. In the serving as a university, we strive to find avenues in the classroom with student activities, as well as apply learning to maximize all your educational opportunities. However, the goal is to go beyond the classroom and of your studies to find avenues to foster learning about who you are, your identity, your beliefs, and what you don't know, you don't know. Regardless of race, class, 
gender, and all the intersectionalities of your identity, it is an obligation to do all that we can to support you and help you to find a place and space on this campus to thrive. As a proud first-generation student, I am fueled by my once ignorance to make sure that I do all I can to tell you how it is and what you need to find in the resources and information and a support system to enrich the journey of being a student. I can tell you right now with 100% certainty, the person you are today will be very different when you take those steps as you cross the graduation stage. Embrace the challenges, the good, the not so fun, and all that college shows you along the way. Ask questions, take advice, be uncomfortable, and study abroad if you have the opportunity. And through all the, throughout it all, find comfort in your skin and know that your uniqueness is something to be proud of. Continue to find ways to know yourself, to love yourself. No matter what we do at a, as a university and what we provide you along this way to serve you, ultimately, it is you who will be your biggest advocate. Give yourself grace and always be mindful of taking care of yourself. Go Shockers. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Mata, for your inspiring words this morning. Good morning, everyone. My name is Eiran Sosodorarte, and I have the privilege of serving as Assistant Director of First Year Programs here at Wichita State University. We're going to start off a little bit differently this morning, um, and I hope you all can play along with me. So I'm going to say woo, and you all say shock. It's going to go like this, woo, shock, woo, shock. Is everybody ready? Thumbs up. More thumbs in the back, please. Thank you. All right, we're getting started. Ready? Woo. Shock. Woo. Shock. I think we could do better, which is all state. So let's do that one more time. Woo. Shock. Woo. Shock. Thank you. <laughs> all right, everybody. It is now time to hear from our featured keynote speaker. This year, we are excited to have a moderated question and answer session with our keynote author, who will answer some questions submitted from students in our first year seminar classes. Our featured keynote speaker, Kiara Alegria Hudes, is a writer, a strong wife, a mother of two, a barrio feminist, and a native of West Philly, USA. Held for her works, her intellectual rigor, and rich imagination, her plays and musicals have been performed around the world. They include Water by the Spoonful, winner of the Pulitzer Prize for Drama, In the Heights, winner of the Tony Award for Best Musical and Pulitzer finalist, and Elliot, a soldier's fatigue, another Pulitzer finalist. Hudes also wrote the screenplay adaptation for In the Heights, which was released in movie theaters in the summer of 2020. Today, she is joining us as she shares some insights from her touching memoir, My Broken Language. Please help me in welcoming our moderator, myself, <laughs> and also our featured speaker, Kiara Aligar Hudes to the stage. Hello, hello. Thank you for those earlier speeches. Really inspiring and, and beautiful. And thank you all for reading my book. Thank you for having me. I'm so happy to be here and to hear about your story and to share some of mine with you. All right, everyone. Well, Kira, on behalf of Wichita State University, welcome to Chakra Nation and also to the great state of Kansas. How are you doing this morning? I'm curious about what the story behind Shocker is. <laughs> you know, there's a long history, and, you know, I would love to tell you a little bit more after this. <laughs> Ooh. Right. Lots of unpack. Should I be nervous? <laughs> um, but, yeah, we're, we're super excited for you to be here this morning. Um, it's a privilege and an honor to share this stage with you, and also just to be here, learn, and reflect with you with some of your life experiences from your memoir, My Broken Language, and there are some very beautiful moments, definitely some points of joy and laughter, but... You know, there are also some very real moments 
um, that I think myself and many in this room have connected with. So um, as mentioned earlier, I'd like to move on to some of our questions that were submitted from, from some of our first year students here at Wichita State University. Let's do it. Great. So the first question that we have for you this morning is, how and when did you know that you had found your calling? How and when did I know I had found my calling? Um, the book, I don't, I don't know that everyone here has finished the book. I think most students are somewhere still in process of reading. Um, but just so you know, timeline-wise, the book goes up through um, me going to school for being a playwright. It doesn't actually, it stops before I start my career, before I start my professional life. Um, so how did I know I had chosen the right path? Um, as you know from the book, I was a curious kid and I kind of followed those curiosities, like I kept pulling the thread of the sweater. And especially in two regards, one was in music. I just loved music so much and I dove deep, I played by ear, I learned how to read music. Um, and the other one was eavesdropping on all my family stories. Um, you know, not something anyone ever thinks of as a career, I just liked to do that. Um, I think what I did was I followed that passion of music until life told me, and this is a, a moment in the book, life said, let it go. Um, I never thought that was coming. I thought I'm going to be a musician all my life. And all of a sudden, this passion I had spent, you know, 20 years of my life diving into, my heart just said, say goodbye and thank, thank you, music, for all you've given me. I didn't see that coming at all. It was shocking. And then at that same moment, I knew I had a new path to pursue, which was writing. And I did that for the next 20 years of my life, playwriting, to be specific. Um, always reading a lot, going to see a lot of theater, just following my curiosities, listening to community stories. And now I'm 46, and a few years ago, something similar happened in my life, which was thank that and bless that and send it on its way. It's time to do something different so I'm writing books now, you know, so I don't know when I figured out which was the right path because I'm still figuring it out and life is showing me too. I'm not just sitting in a dark room strategizing. I'm, I'm responding to just my heart as I move through the world. Um, but a, another quick story, the personal version of how I knew playwriting was the, the right life for me, and this is not in the book, this is after the book. Um, my first play in New York, I wanted to write a play about um, Puerto Rican men and women in the United States military. Really interesting history that even though my family was part of, I didn't know much about beyond our family stories. So I interviewed my cousin who had served in Iraq as a Marine, and I wanted to interview my Theo, my uncle George, who had served as a Marine in Vietnam. So I was going, I planned to interview him about his service. and. His wife, my Aunt Ginny, it's like, oh, he never talks about that. Good luck with that interview. Theo George is a very jolly, friendly person, but that is stuff we don't talk about. Well, I made a time. I went over to Theo's house, sat down with him. He poured us some orange sodas, and I asked him one question. I said, what year did you enlist? And he spoke for three hours straight about something he never talks about that. He cried. I had never seen Theo George cry. He chuckled a lot. He told me about the nightmares that still haunt him. He told me about being cleanup crew in the United States Marines, which you can imagine what's being cleaned up. Uh, he told me about falling in love. He told me a whole life of his. And I called him the next week to thank him for that interview. And he said, no, Kiki, which is you know, it's my nickname when I was a kid, Kiki. He said, no, Kiki, I have to thank you. I said, for what? He said, I haven't felt this light in 30 years. And I did that by asking him a question, literally asking him, can you tell me your story? It was the simplest, easiest thing I could do. And so whatever happened with the plays, whatever prizes they get, whatever, if they go to Broadway, if they get good reviews, what, that didn't even matter anymore. The ability to have a process 
that can make a connection like that, I knew I had chosen the right path. Yeah, and I would love to touch on a little bit about, you know, you've been through several transitions, you've done some exploring in your life and different careers, and, um, you know, I'd love to learn more about, um, you know, what helped you keep grounded during all of those transitions, um, from being a playwright to a producer to a mother, you know, what really helped you in keeping grounded through it all? Well, as you know, I come from a family largely of women, and there was a lot of wisdom there. So the wisdom that I, it, would, it was helpful. Um, for instance, one thing I think of is they used to tell stories about um, when my mom grew up in Arecibo in Puerto Rico, they always would not finish the dinner food. They were humble, they were farmers. There was not a lot of, you know, a lot of money. They were humble meals but they always set aside one plate just in case a neighbor walked by so that they could say, come sit and eat. You know, and that's like a life philosophy. Um, you know, my, my theater actors used to be so confused and be like, why, why are you feeding us at the beginning of rehearsal? Let's just get to work. I'm like, because this is part of this. We're making a family here. Um, little bits of wisdom like that. Uh, I interviewed a man named Corey Menifee who um, changed, he was a dining hall worker at Yale. He was one of the people who served the students food and cleaned up after the students every day while I was a student there. He also um, vandalized a part of the school. He knocked out a window that kind of showed a kind of glorified, beautiful portrayal of slavery because Yale has ties to slavery and um, he, when, once he saw that, it really irked him, and he couldn't take it anymore, and he knocked out, he banged out the window, he got in big trouble, he got arrested for it. Um, and I interviewed him about his relationship with the college. And one of the things he told me with a big smile, he was so proud, he said, you know, I always had the, the um, ability to walk with kings and bums alike. These little bits of wisdom you hear from your community members and from everyday people, what a, what a beautiful thing to try to do, to walk with kings and bums alike, to, to be able to, to hang in both of those spaces. So those, those little bits of wisdom keep me grounded. I love that. And um, community and, you know, respecting your elders and the wisdom from, you know, our ancestors are deeply important. And you touch on that a lot on, um, within your memoir. So, um, you know, our next question that we had was, how are you able to keep your community with you in all of your success? Well, it's part of my mission, right? So are there, are there a lot of first generation students here first in the audience? That was me. Um, and it's weird because when I got to college, I was very excited about classes. I was the total like nerd of the century. I just wanted to take every class I could. Um, I was very excited academically, but I was more nervous socially. And I had this feeling walking around campus that if my family, I could kind of blend in, but if my whole family was there, there would just be this vibe of like, what are they doing here a little bit? Um, I remember going into the, the music library because I was a music major undergrad and I went to the listening library. It's, it's what it sounds like. Um, it's a little different now with that we can listen to music on our phones, but it used to be that if I wanted to hear a Beethoven sonata or a Gershwin song, I would go to the listening library, they'd pull a record or a tape, I'd take it to a little listening station and put it on and listen to it. And I heard that they had an ethnomusicology section there. Now the, the music department at Yale was largely Western, white Western classical music. And so ethnomusicology was, to me, what it sounded like a little bit of a code word, even though it was a department, but it was also like a code word for not Western white classical. So I was like, oh, let me check this out. Maybe it has some music that I'm interested in from my community, from my home. I went, and this is a big, beautiful library on campus. And I went to the, to the ethnomusicology section, and it was two shelves, like this wide, on the floor. So it's like you have to get down to see it. I mean, it was really... It was kind of uncool, and then I took it out, and the tapes just said things like Senegal or Puerto Rico. It didn't even have individual artists' names listed on it. 
And meanwhile, everything is like Beethoven, Strauss, Haydn, Mozart. I'm like, these men's names mattered so much. But this is just a tape that says Senegal. And it upset me so much that I thought like, I still think about that today. I, it made me think about how my mom used to tell me that with the history of colonization in Puerto Rico, a lot of names were erased. A lot of indigenous names, a lot of African names were, were removed from people and the colonizers names were put on them. And I just felt like, no, we get a shelf with our names on it became kind of a mission of mine. And how do I do that? How do I bring my community with me? I, I ask their stories. I knock on their doors. I say, you know, can you tell me about the time when, for instance, towards the beginning of the book, mommy, can you tell me about the time when you lost your hair as a child? What was healthcare like? What were the doctors doing in Arecibo, Puerto Rico? And I'm putting our names on those shelves. And part of the hope is that that inspires other people to tell their stories and put their names and their community's names on those shelves. And it sounds like that you've had lots of influences, lots of inspiration from your community, your family, and um, definitely those you've met within the years. And um, how do you sometimes work around the conflicting opinions that you might get from your influences of, hey, Kiara, maybe you should consider this safe option instead of doing, doing X, Y, or Z. How do you navigate those influences while also doing what's best for yourself? I think the memoir is a really good example of what happens when <laughs> I am trying to do an act of love and healing um, within my community, but it also brings up taboo subjects and stuff that's gonna get me in trouble, basically. Um, I think the, mo the clearest example of that in the book is talking about HIV AIDS. Um, because again, almost like Vietnam a little bit, it's like we don't talk about that. Even though I had fierce advocates in my family advocating for others outside of the home, even inside Abuela's house, inside my mom's house, these were difficult topics of conversation, very taboo, very taboo. I mention in passing in the book that I knew someone who in the community, and when I say the community, it's North, I'm talking about North Philadelphia, largely Puerto Rican community then, now it's more kind of Latin American more broadly. Um, I knew someone in the community who his brother passed from complications of AIDS and he didn't go to the funeral because there was so much misinformation and they had been really close. There was so much misinformation then that he thought, I'm gonna get AIDS if I go to my brother's funeral. And we talked about it since then, me and this person in the community and it's his biggest regret in life. He said, I had no idea. I missed my best friend's funeral. I missed my brother's funeral out of ignorance. So how do I break these taboos at the same time that I show a community this is an act of love and healing, right? Because we hear a lot of talk about healing, we hear a lot of talk about wellness as if it's all supposed to just feel good and feel fuzzy. No, when you're trying to heal a wound, you're touching the wound and that hurts. There is pain involved. Um, so when I'm thinking about how do I honor my community but also tell the truth, I always do a gut check. I always go back inside and, and ask myself, what is my intention here? Um, is my intention to tell a dramatic story with lots of scandal and you know life and death stakes? Or is my intention to explore the difficult places that we still hold inside us and to tell the truth? You know, to really instigate, uh, really interrogate what my intention is. And with the book, I decided that, you know, talking about illiteracy, I was terrified. I was so terrified because my, some of my family members who still deal with illiteracy, they're embarrassed. They don't want that to be broadcast to the world. But by the same token, without advocating for the need, the need never gets addressed. So of course I did, I, I took some technical measures to honor their like um, 
anonymity and to not name names, change some descriptions and stuff like that. But I thought, no, I, this book, I want this book to be a sword of truth. And that sword of truth might cut a little bit, um, but we've come this far. We've come this far. I trusted that there could be survival even if it ripped the wound a little bit to heal it. Um, I mean, for I, I know a lot of you are first generation. Do, do some of you come from migrant families, immigrant families, um, other nations, other backgrounds? Anyone out there? I mean, anyone who has that, talk about a tremendous leap of faith that our parents took, our grandparents took, our ancestors took, that we ourselves took. There is no bigger leap of faith than that. There is no bigger abandoning of a community than that. We make ourselves lost to come here, to come to the United States. And yet, we expand the circle of who our community is by doing that act too. So, you know, it's, it's both of those things. Thank you, and you spoke a little bit about some of the mentors and role models definitely within your book, a lot of them within your family, um, mother, grandmother, community members, and um, some of our students are wondering, you know, how, how impactful was those role models and having someone like you help you through your success and really helping you get to where you are today? Um, so I'm, I'm very excited to be talking to a group of freshmen um, because I think one of the great opportunities that a college campus provides is um, Iris, sorry, I don't know if you pronounce it Iris or Edis, but um, mentioned finding your, find your people. And that's not just your peers, that's your mentors too. It might, you might feel a little shy about asking oh, well, you know, I don't want to bother that person, or who am I? I'm no one. They don't know who I am. Trust me, like, as I've also taught, I've also mentored people, there's nothing more exciting to a, an educator than a young person who comes up and is like, can you tell me more? I want to know more. I have more questions. It's like, yes, yes, please, let's talk. Um, there's so many potential mentors around you, and they know and have so much life experience that's different than yours. These are ways that you can soak up entirely new worlds and lives without having to live those lives. Um, I had mentors all my life. I, I was always gravitating towards the grown-ups. I always wanted to ask a million questions. Those are some of the richest relationships of my life. And then will come a time when your job is to always respect and be grateful, be in, in gratitude to those mentors, but then to move onto your own path too. Um, one of the best bits of advice my mom gave me was, you are not to walk anyone's path but your own. I still think about that today. You are not to walk anyone's path but your own. But your path will include mentors. So find them, they're here in the audience. I'm guessing you're gonna be a mentor to some of the people here in the audience. Um, yeah, I had, I remember my piano teacher, she was like a mentor to me. She was this really larger than life Russian woman. And my piano lesson was the last of the day. So she was exhausted and most of her piano students were kind of badly playing Twinkle Twinkle Little Star. They really didn't care, really didn't want to take piano lessons. Their parents forced them to, whereas I really wanted to. And she would, she was always starving by the time I came in and she would just eat apples whole. She'd eat the apple, then she'd eat the core. And then she'd grab my fingers, which were still sticky with apple juice, and she'd like slam them into the keys. And it was just, these are, these are great memories from my life. You know, she'd be like, your, your fourth finger is the oboe, your fifth finger is the piccolo, piccolo, piccolo. And I'd be like, oh, my finger's gonna fall off. You know, these are wonderful, wonderful memories. Um, I have a million memories like that. She sent me, she got sick of me writing my own music, so she sent me down the hall to Mr. Rappaport's uh, studio. I didn't have money for, you know, to pay Mr. Rappaport. He said, come on, I'm gonna give you free lessons, which he did for a year and taught me music theory, especially when he found out I got into college. He was like, you're not ready for college. So we're, I'm teaching you music theory. You know, these, he, out of the kindness of his heart, he did this. Um, there are people in your community who would love to share the gift of their experiences with you. With that, Kiara, 
We are approaching the end of our time, so I was just wondering if you have a final message for all of our first year students here at Wichita State. Um, one thing I hear about a lot from students, and I don't know if this is something that, that you all experience, is imposter syndrome. Um, the sense of, I don't belong here, I'm just, try I'm just fooling them for now, when am I gonna be found out as like a fraud in these spaces? I think there's this notion that your job as a college student is to become like a proper college student, and that's something that you are not yet, no, your job is not to go into a room and fit into that room. Your job is to go into a, a room and expand what that room is. That's your job. There's no place in the world that you fit and that's made for you. Your job is to make your place in the world. Um, and what does that mean? It just means following your curiosities. It means being kind with yourself if you're in a room full of students that have a totally different background and that seem much more knowledgeable in something than you. That's okay, be kind with yourself. You have something to bring to that room. Um, what I know, I know very few things for certain. This is why I'm a writer, because I don't know anything, so I have to always piece through it. But what I know for certain is you belong in the universe. There's no other possible explanation. You belong in the universe. So if you belong in the universe, you belong in a lecture hall, okay? If you belong in the universe, you belong in a seminar room. Those are small potatoes. And you have to figure out how. How do I belong here? What is my contribution? It might take you a long time to find out. It might be very easy. Um, I'll leave with um, some, some inspiration I took from Dolores Huerta. She started um, the United Farm Workers Movement with um, Chavez decades ago. You know, for migrant farmers and migrant laborers, there weren't bathrooms in the fields where they were picking the fruit that we eat on our dinner table or that we eat in our breakfast bowl. There weren't um, provisions for their health care. Uh, Dolores and, and Chavez, they, they got those provisions. They fought very hard for, the, for small incremental labor rights, like a bathroom on a farm field, that sort of thing. So Dolores was the only woman, when they were, when they were organizing these farm unions, she was the only woman in these rooms, right? So. She didn't really belong in those rooms. And a lot of, it was a lot of um, agitators like she was, but also a lot of like farm owners, a lot of farm managers. And she said that at the first meeting that they organized, there was like 40 or 50 of them there. There was just a lot of derogatory language used about women. And her way is very quiet. She's, she's a quiet person. And so at the end of the meeting, there's a time where they say, is there any new business that needs to be brought up before they end the meeting? And she raised her hand and she said, well, yeah, I have some new business. You know, I was really sad that to, to notice that there was a lot of sexist and derogatory against women language used in this meeting. How are we going to succeed as a movement? And all the men were like, no, 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 we didn't. She said, I know, I didn't believe it either. So I just started writing down the words when they were said. She didn't say who said the words, she just read the words that had been heard in, in a non-accusatory way. She said, I hope next time there would be fewer. The next meeting, when they said, is there any new business, she raised her hand, she said, well, I just wanna thank you because last week there had been 72 derogatory words and this week there were only 23. Thank you. And she read the 23. And then the next meeting, there were zero. She didn't belong in that room, but she found a way through her own, you know, they're talking loud, they're talking strong, she's talking quiet, she's talking at the end, but boy, did she find a way to change that room for the better. And now there's things like bathrooms on a strawberry field. You know, these, you belong in the rooms where you are, but you might have to figure out how. Ooh, can we get everyone applause for that? <laughs> Well, Kara, I could stay up here and talk to you all day, but unfortunately, <laughs> I can't do that. Um, but Kara, it's been an honor and privilege to share this stage with you and to share in your healing and learning and growing. And I um, just want to thank you again. Everyone, can we please give um, our keynote speaker, Kiara Allegra Cuties, a round of applause? Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. And maybe.
and maybe I'll get to talk with some of you after at the book signing yes. afterwards. So, well, yeah, no one, <laughs> nobody leave yet. We are not finished. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much for spending time with us this morning. I enjoyed listening to your experience and thank you for sharing a bit of yourself with our community campus today. Now we are excited to be joined by a special ensemble who will be leading us in one of our favorite traditions of this program, singing the alma mater. This year, we are hearing for the first time a new arrangement of the alma mater. You can find the words on the screen of the stage. After the pro program, please join us for a reception and book signing by Kiara at the Ulrich Museum, second floor. Please stand as we all join the choir in singing the alma mater. Thank you for joining us today for today's program. Please head out to the Ulrich Museum second floor where we can meet you for Kiara at the book signing and reception. Have a great year, shockers.